Well, welcome to all of you who are joining us online, as well as those of you who are meeting here at Central Campus, along with others of you who are meeting at one of our other campuses in Airdrie and Bridgeland, South Calgary, and Bears Paw. If you're visiting with us today and you're relatively new to our church, typically once a year, I give a vision and state of the church address in which I sort of have a family chat with our church and focus on what God has been doing in and through our church, challenges we're facing, issues we need to address, and also where we believe God is leading us as a church. And so what I share today uh, will be a little different than on a typical weekend, but it will introduce you to our vision and mission and other things that we're passionate about as a church. For those of you who are wondering if there is a biblical basis for doing this, well, I just want to remind you that in the second and third chapter of Revelation, Jesus gave a state of the church address to the seven churches of ancient Asia. I encourage you to read that sometime. And that's located, uh, this ancient Asia is located in what is modern Turkey today. And so with that in mind, I'm just going to ask you if you would stand with me as we dedicate this time to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, again, we thank you uh, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for uh, your church, that your kingdom has come, Lord, that we're praying that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, you would do it uh, through your church. Lord, today, I would ask that you would help us in understanding what it means to live a missional lifestyle. Um, and Lord, that you would give us the courage to respond to what it is you say to us today. For I pray it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You would be seated. I'm sure it comes as no surprise to you that um, over the last few years, interest in the end times and the second coming of Jesus has skyrocketed. And given what's going on in our nation and around the world, one can understand why. What we see around us just seems to have turned upside down on so many different uh, fronts. People are wondering, I mean, is this the beginning of the end? Are we in the last days before Christ's return? Now, even though prophecy is a fascinating area of study, and many television preachers would have you believe they know how and when events leading up to Christ's return are going to play out. The truth of the matter is, the only thing we know for sure from Scripture is that Jesus is coming again. Amen. Period. Amen. That's it. Everything else is speculation. Yes, we're given a number of signs of Christ's coming in Scripture, but these are given to us not to have us spending most of our time huddling and speculating on how Christ's return might play out. No, they are given to us to remind us to be awake and alert, to be ready to meet him when he returns or when we die. And to do all we can to wake up, to challenge and to influence people we know who are far from God, to know Jesus and to be ready to meet Jesus when he returns. In Mark chapter 13, verse 33, Jesus said, Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and he puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task. And he tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back. If he comes suddenly... Do not let him find you sleeping. Now notice the last sentence. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. Jesus isn't asking us to not sleep. 
or to not get our rest. No, he's saying, don't fall asleep on the mission that I've called you to. I mean, let me put it this way. If you knew Jesus was coming back exactly one year from today, what would be your first thought? Would it be excitement in knowing that you will soon see him face to face? Or would it be, oh man, there are so many things on my bucket list I want to do and experience yet. Would you get out your calendar, plan a bunch of trips and experiences this coming year? Would you apply for that promotion that you've always wanted? Would you purchase all the things you dreamed of having one day? You know, that special house, that, the cottage, the car of your dreams. Or would your first thought be those people in your life who don't know Jesus? Who aren't ready to meet him? And doing all you can this coming year to introduce them to the Jesus that you know and love. You see, Jesus coming again alerts us to the same truth that death alerts us to. That happens every time we're at a funeral. And that is this life will not always go on as it has. You see, death can be a teacher of wisdom. It can teach us to number our days. Jesus may not come back for many years yet, but the reality is no one has any guarantee that they will live to see tomorrow. When Jesus says, be awake and alert, he's challenging us to live with eternity in mind, to not let contemporary counterfeit gods like our possessions or power or position or popularity or pleasures distract us from the realization that there are only two things that's going to matter in the end. And that is where you stand with God and where other people stand with God. That's it. And so here's the thing. We need to understand that in the same way the heart of a parent breaks and agonizes when their son or daughter walks away and refuses to be in relationship with them, God's heart breaks when his spiritual kids want nothing to do with him. And so when we join him in reaching his spiritually lost kids, we are involved in the most God-glorifying activity possible because nothing is closer to God's heart. 1 Timothy 2.4 says it very well. God, our Savior, wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That is the supreme reason I believe that we Christians are still here on this planet and not in heaven. And this is why our mission as a church is to introduce people to Jesus and then help them to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. Now, I believe that most Christians understand this. They get it. The problem is many of us struggle with living a missional lifestyle. Because we don't think we know enough. We, we think we're incapable of explaining the good news of Jesus to someone. Well, if you're feeling this way, and you, I think you're going to be encouraged by what I'm about to share with you. I want to describe to you today what a missional lifestyle looks like. The mission that Jesus calls us to is recorded in Matthew chapter 28, a passage that many of us are familiar with. This is what Jesus said. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now there's a couple of things in that passage that I want to draw your attention to. And the first is Jesus assures us that he will be with us. He is in us as Christ followers and he will live his life through us. We are not left to do this on our own. Secondly, this verse is not only directed to each of us as Christians, but it's also directed to all of us together as a church. We all have a role to play. In other words, as we're going to see in a moment, while there are some things that God calls each of us to do, there are other things he really wants all of us as a church to do together. So let me unpack that a little bit more. How do we live a missional lifestyle? Well, fundamentally, it is doing it one life at a time. On your way into the worship center today, you received a little card that looks like this. That's entitled Missional Living. On one side of this handout are steps that each of us can take in partnership with the Spirit's leading to introduce people to Jesus and then help them become fully devoted followers of Christ one life at a time. Each of these steps are based on Scripture. And as you will see, you don't have to, be a, you don't have, to have a Bible school degree to do them. All you need is a heart for people, a passion to introduce people to Jesus, and total dependence on the leading and on the power of the Holy Spirit. On the back of this little handout, you see the heading, Person of Peace. A person of peace is someone that God has placed in your life and on your heart. A person who seems to like you. A person who enjoys spending time with you. And even joining you in helping and serving others. A person of peace is not someone who has a conniption or loses it when you mention the name Jesus and let you know in no uncertain terms that they don't want you talking about Jesus and they don't want to discuss matters of faith with you. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus taught his disciples about people of peace. And he basically said, some people will welcome you and others will not. And then what he said, he said, just kind of shake your, the dust off your feet and head on in a different direction or go to another town. And what he's really saying here is, is that some people are going to welcome you and others will not. And what he's taught in that passage is if people are close to talking to you about Jesus and therefore closed to you, focus instead on those who are open to you, who welcome you, and don't reject you because of your faith. They may not agree with you. They may not believe what you believe. But they're open to being your friend. And so with that in mind, I want you to think about someone that you know. It could be a neighbor. It could be a person at work. A person at school. In your gymnastics class. On your hockey or your pickleball team. Who has yet to experience the reality of Jesus the way that you have. Someone you've had opportunity to get to know somewhat who seems to be a person of peace. Take a moment and think about who that might be in your life. And young people that are present here today, I'm asking you to think about this as well. This isn't just an adult exercise. I want you to think about that person that you know who isn't ready to meet Jesus if Jesus were to come back tomorrow. 
And then write the first name of that person on the side of the, on the one side here of the card um, under person of peace. Let's say the person's name that you wrote on your handout is Larry. And if you're a female, let's say the person of peace is Mary. As a Christ follower, you sincerely want Larry and Mary to know Jesus the way that you do. Larry isn't your special spiritual project. Your goal isn't to convert him to Christianity. No, your goal is to genuinely develop a friendship with him and at the right time to share with him what Jesus means to you. And then having done that, to leave it with Larry and leave it with the Lord. You're not reaching out to Larry to get brownie points with God or to show others how spiritual and how committed you are to Christ. No, your only desire is that Larry would come to realize, as you have, that he really matters to God. And that he would come to know the Jesus that you know. And that he would come to experience the love, the forgiveness, and the grace of God, and the joy, the, the peace, the fulfillment, and satisfaction, and freedom that you have found in Christ. And so with that in mind, how are you going to introduce Larry or Mary to Christ? Well, the first step is to pray for Larry. This is the most powerful thing you can do. Because when you pray, you are inviting God to do what you can't do. You are inviting God to reveal himself to Larry. You're inviting God to work, to begin working in Larry's life, to pour out his grace on Larry and that God would also work through you that he would give you wisdom in what to say and not say and what to do and not do so long before <coughs> you talk to Larry about God be sure to talk to God about Larry because God is the one who changes a person's heart and life, not you or me. A second step is to begin to care for Larry. Let me ask you, what goes through your mind when a total stranger knocks on your door and asks to talk to you for a few minutes? Now, in our culture, most people will be suspicious, you know, they'll be wondering, you know, what's he after? What's his angle? You'll even be wondering, you know, is, you know, how mentally stable is this guy? Especially over the last few years as our culture has become increasingly polarized. Most people have little interest in talking to someone who, who knocks on their door unsolicited. Before people are open to us and to listening to us, most need to know us first. They need to get a sense that we're real, that we're normal, down-to-earth people, and that we face some of the same issues and problems and fears in life that they do. They need to know that we're genuine, that, that we have their best interests at heart. As someone once said, people just don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. So how can you demonstrate that you care? Well, one way is just to begin serving Larry. It's shoveling a neighbor's walk. It's helping them to paint their fence. It's helping them to fix something, providing you know how to fix that something. Maybe a problem otherwise. It's offering to help a coworker start their car or drive them home. It's bringing someone a coffee 
or helping someone move or bringing a meal over to someone who's sick or has just come out of the hospital. I mean, the list is endless of how we can serve others. A further way to care is to include them in your life. Invite them over for a meal or go out for lunch or coffee with them. Invite them to go golfing or to a sporting event with them. You know, research tells us that there are people all around us who are dying of loneliness. And see, Christ, he's saying to you and me, I, 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 I don't want you to be like everybody else. I want you to take a risk. The risk of rejection. And to reach out. And extend a hand of friendship to others. And that includes those that God brings across your path in your neighborhood, at school, at work, and yes, right here at our church worship services. You know, on a typical weekend, we have over 100 visitors attending our services at our five campuses. And some of them feel very much alone. And they've taken a risk to show up here. And they wonder if someone will even notice them. Someone will even say hi and show them the love and the hospitality of Christ. Or will it be just like everywhere else? It's easy in life to just keep hanging out with the same people. Have you ever noticed that? Just always to go out with the same people? And so on your way to church, I've got a bit of a challenge for you. That is that you would intentionally pray that God would guide you to someone that you've not met just to encourage them and just to learn to get to know them a bit. And then after a service, I want to challenge all of us to dedicate the first five minutes as we head out into the atrium and so forth to reach out to someone that you haven't met before. And like I said, get to know them. And if, if they're new or newer to the church than you, perhaps help them to understand why we do what we do and how things work around here and point them in the right direction and just serve them in some way. Your friends will still be there to do the usual visiting, you know, a little time later. But being faithful to God in this, you may meet a person of peace who may one day be a dear friend and part of your community group. So step one and two of a missional living is to pray and to, to, to care for Larry. A third step of missional living is to share with Larry. You see, one day, Larry's going to look at you and he's going to say, you know, what's with you anyways? I mean, most everyone else I know is always concerned about their own interests. It's all about them. Why are you so concerned about me and my interests? In church, at that precise moment, you're going to have an opportunity to share a little bit of your story of how Christ has impacted you and changed your heart and your life from the inside out, from being self-focused to being others-focused. And as you do, your friendship with Larry will enter into a whole new dimension. As you continue to do life with Larry, he may face a crisis, or he may confide in you a deep struggle that he's having with anxiety or fear, or a concern about his marriage, or a, a concern about a rebellious child, which will give you opportunity to speak into his life based upon what you've learned from Christ himself, or to point him to Christ-centered resources. Sharing is planting seeds of truth, whereas caring is focused on the heart. Sharing is focused on the mind. It's giving Larry a book. It's sending him a link to a sermon or a podcast 
that addresses a question or an issue that he's wrestling with. It's helping answer Larry's questions by encouraging him to, to listen to uh, something or to read or to watch something. It also means you're prepared to share your story and the good news of Jesus if the door for that opens in a concise and compelling way. First Peter 3 says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. Have you ever thought about what you would say if someone asked you why you're a Christian? What makes you tick? If you don't feel prepared to do that, we offer special courses that will help you to do that. They're going to be offered soon again. So just keep checking with the information desk and online. And so you pray for Larry, you care for him, and at the appropriate time, you share seeds of truth with him. The fourth step to missional living is to invite Larry to come and see. Now, as I said earlier, Jesus' command to go and make disciples isn't just directed to each of us. It's also directed to all of us as a church together. And I hope that encourages you because you see, let's face it, it's a challenge introducing others to Jesus all by yourself in our culture, particularly in a culture that is increasingly becoming hostile toward Christians in the church. And that's why years ago, we made a decision to be on mission together as a church. Our staff is committed to helping you introduce people to Jesus by providing training in how to share your story and your faith in Jesus Christ, providing resources to help answer some of the questions that Larry or Mary are asking, by providing practical care, financial counseling and pastoral care and support for those who need the essentials of life like food and clothing, financial counseling, career advice through our compassionate ministries. We're also committed to offering outreach events like Kids Camp, Family Fest, and Christmas Fest put on by our children's ministry and all the volunteers that help make those happen as well as youth and young adult outreach events and retreats, and all those who join in and serve to make those events happen. Sports and recreation events put on by our sports ministry, and all those who help to serve to make those happen. Special concerts and worship experiences put on by our worship ministry, and all those who volunteer and serve to make those happen and classes like Alpha and Why Believe. In addition, this fall, we are reintroducing something that we did years ago. It's a weekend service that happens once a month where the message addresses questions and issues that the people of peace in our lives, the Larry and the Marys, are asking. Questions about what we believe as Christians and why we believe it. We used to call it Friendship Weekend, but we're now going to call it Come and See Weekends. These Come and See Weekends will happen the first Sunday of every month, except when the first Sunday is on a long weekend. Even though the message will have people like Larry and Mary in mind, it will also serve to remind you as Christians and to equip you to know how to answer people when they ask you certain questions. And so my challenge to all of us is that between now, this is April, almost May, and September, that we would begin to intentionally pray about, Lord, who is that person of peace that you want me to invest part of my life into? And then at the God-appointed time that you would be able to invite the the Larry in your life or the Mary in your life to our Come and See weekend beginning this fall. And so to summarize, when it comes to missional living, each of us are called 
to pray, to care, and to share with our person of peace, the Larry and Mary of our lives. And then at God's appointed time, to invite Larry and Mary to our monthly come and see weekends or to concerts or to a variety of other outreach events that I mentioned earlier that help in the process to introducing them to Jesus and his church. And you see, that is where all of us can be involved in playing a part in seeing people come to Christ. Now here's the thing. Over the years, as we have prayed, as we have cared, as we have shared, as we have invited the Larrys of our lives and worked together as a church to be on mission, we have seen thousands of people come to faith in Christ. Just a few weeks ago, at our Easter services, and many of you would have heard this already, over 140 children, youth, and adults made first-time decisions for Jesus Christ. And over 200 people recommitted their lives to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> And many of these people were invited by one of you. The trajectories of their lives and of their eternities is forever changed because some of you prayed for them, cared for them, shared with them, and then invited them. Now imagine that you invited Larry and his wife Mary and their family to the Easter services here at Center Street a few weeks ago. And they said, yes, we'll be there. They come to church only to discover that there was not enough room for their children to be part of children's ministry. And as a result, they were distracted through the entire worship service because they spent all of that time trying to keep their kids from disrupting everybody else around them. Or suppose they walk into the worship center and they can't find a seat. Now, wouldn't that just break your heart? And wouldn't it break your heart even more if the Larry that was invited by the person next to you or on your row is actually your son or the Mary that a person on this side of the church invited is actually your daughter or your mom or dad or brother or sister and you see the unfortunate thing is this happens often at some of our campuses and in some of our weekend worship services, this being one of them. You see all the numbers that go up on the screen. That's asking for help. That's saying we've got a bunch of kids we can't, we can't accommodate. And so when we challenge you to prayerfully consider serving or we challenge you to prayerfully consider attending another service that has more room. We're not saying that because we want to make things difficult for you or mess with your schedule or your routine. We're saying that because we want to make a way for Larry and Mary to find answers and to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And when you hear us talk about our BUILD initiative, and making more room for God. And we ask you to pray and to give to our BUILD initiative. It isn't because our primary focus is on having more buildings. No, our primary focus is people making room for adults and youth and children who need the Lord. And so thank you, and I'm very sincere when I say this, thank you for making sacrifices in your life and your schedule 
going to less crowded services in order to make more room for those who are seeking the Lord. Thank you for making financial sacrifices by giving over and above your regular giving to help us provide the space that's needed to make more room for the children and youth, people with special needs, and on and on it goes who need the Lord. Which brings us to the second part of our mission statement. Notice again in Matthew 28, Jesus not only calls us to make disciples and to baptize them, but in verse 20, he goes on to call us to teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. You see, that's the scriptural basis for the second part of our mission statement that you see here. We help them become fully devoted followers of Christ. The first part that we've just looked at is to introduce people to Jesus. The second part now is to help them to grow in Christ. Let's assume that in God's timing and in God's way, your person of peace, Larry or Mary, puts their trust in Jesus Christ. Major cause for celebration. However, even though Larry may be 14 years old, or 30 years old, or 60 years old physically. Larry is a spiritual baby in the sense that his spiritual life is just beginning. Well, in the same way that a loving parent will not leave their newborn child to fend for themselves, it is important that you not leave Larry to fend for himself spiritually but you continue to provide direction and support to help him grow spiritually. Now, that doesn't mean <coughs> that you're charged with doing everything for Larry. As a church, again, we've been called together to partner with one another to help Larry grow in his faith. In the same way that parents rely on others to help with certain aspects of their child's development, you can also rely on different people and ministries of the church to help Larry grow in his faith. While there may be things that you can do, that you're gifted to do, that you have time to do, there are other aspects of Larry's spiritual development that you may not be able to provide, or you may not have the time to do so, but there are others in the church who can't. Your primary role is to serve as Larry's spiritual coach. To give him direction. To point out, for example, you know, Larry, you may, you may want to take this class because you've been asking all kinds of questions and this class addresses those questions. Or you may, want, may be wondering about how, you know, how you can grow in your, 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 your faith. Well, that class really speaks to that. And so as his spiritual coach, Another step you can take that you see listed on here is to invite Larry to worship with you at one of our weekend worship services. Our weekend services are times that we stop from the hectic pace of life and we remind ourselves of the nature and the character of our God. And we praise and we worship him through song, through prayer, through scriptures read, and through the Lord's Supper, and through baptism. It's a time that our faith is strengthened by hearing stories of what God has done and what God is doing in the lives of others. And of course, it is a time we take in uh, mostly the systematic teaching through the scriptures, which we believe is the baseline of discipleship. We've been taking you through the book of Romans, and we're going to finish that by summertime. We're going to get there. Trust me. But we've been taking you through that. We've been taking you through Exodus. If you've been here regularly, you know, someone said to me just last week, they feel that they've had a Bible school education just by attending the services and the teaching that happens in our services. And so missional living involves inviting Larry to worship with you. 
Furthermore, missional living involves discipling Larry in the essentials of the faith. Larry needs to grow deeper in his faith and his understanding. He needs to learn how to pray, how to study the Bible, the importance of baptism, the importance of being a generous person, the importance of being in community with other believers, the importance of serving others. And of course, it would be best if you could mentor uh, Larry because you've got a relationship with him already. But if you're unable to do that because you're serving in another area, there are people who have been equipped to do that and are available to do so. Just get in touch with our spiritual development ministry area. Now, while Larry's being discipled in the essentials of the faith, he is being supported through a small group. Hopefully, your small group. Larry will need prayer. He will need support in his spiritual walk as he deals with all the different dynamics and stuff that's going on in his life. And he's not going to find that level of support solely by attending a weekend worship service like this. Whether a worship service has 200 people or 2,000 people, you are not going to establish deep, meaningful relationships with others simply by meeting together like this for 90 minutes a week. And that is where the small group comes in. The purpose of the small group or a community group is to do many of the things we can't do at a weekend worship service. And that is to hear each other's stories, to do life together, to care one another when the wheels are falling off of our lives, to support each other, to pray for one another as we reach out to the Larry or the Mary of our life, and also to serve together. God never intended for there to be solo Christians separated from the rest of the church body. In 1 Corinthians, Paul uses the physical body to describe how the church is to function. And one thing uh, that he implies is, is that if a limb or, or, or a finger gets severed from the body, it dies. This finger that was once there has died. It is no longer alive. It's no longer part of my body. And so I challenge you to stop seeing the church merely as a place you come to. I challenge you to begin to see it as a spiritual family that you can belong to. But that's going to require you stepping out and connecting with people. People who may not always see everything the way that you see. But people who are committed to praying for one another. Caring and serving and encouraging one another. And together seeking to live the life that Jesus calls us to live. Now sometimes circumstances like you know, health issues, um, shift work, make it nearly impossible to be part of a community group like this. And I just feel for people in that situation. But I want to challenge you to find a way to meet with a small group of others anyways. We have a ton of pilots and airline people uh, who attend our church. And they have struggled being part of a group because they're gone most of the time and they just around once in a blue moon. I challenged them to get together and they, that is something that they did. And we saw groups of 30 or 40 people coming together all in the airline industry and all not sent from the same company. And, and uh, wonderful community and they all understood when the others weren't there. But they made an effort to get together for some of you men, it may mean, re mean meeting regularly with a few other men for an early morning breakfast. For some of you women, it may mean meeting with a small group of women over lunch. And still for others of you, it may mean serving with others on a ministry team, like a special needs ministry team or a worship ministry team or a youth ministry team. However you find meaningful community with a few others, however, whatever it looks like, on the basis of the hundreds of people that I have talked to and have told me down through the years, 
um, of their experience, I can assure you, you will never see our church as being too big again, nor will you feel alone because you are known and loved by at least a few others. And you will find that is all you need. And so Larry is worshiping. He is being discipled. And he is being supported by a small group of others. Which leads to the final step of missional living. And that is serving. As Larry matures in his faith, something is going to happen to his heart. His heart's going to grow bigger for the things that Christ is concerned about. His heart is going to break over the things that break the heart of God. And over time, he will begin to release that white-knuckled grip on his time and on his talents and on his money. And one day, if he doesn't come to you and say it to you, he's going to say it to God in prayer. Oh God, you saved me from my sins, my regrets, and you freed me to live life to the full. You surrounded me with a community of love and fellowship. You gave me meaning and a clear purpose in life that's going to impact lives for eternity. You gave me the talents and the gifts to make an eternal difference in people's lives. You promised me an eternal home in heaven when I die. Lord, I can't keep this all to myself. And so with your help and your guidance, Lord, I want to serve others even as I have been served by others. And Larry begins to serve in that place that he feels God is calling him to serve. You know, 1 Peter 4.10 says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. As you heard from last week's sermon from Pastor Ashwin and your campus pastor, we are a spiritual family as a church. And in a healthy family, everyone pitches in to help us to be ready for company when people of peace like Larry and Mary come to visit our church. Again, let me take you back a few weeks to the Easter weekend when the earthly and the eternal trajectory of around 340 people was forever changed. You see, many of us were used by God to play a part in those decisions. Some of you, as I said, invited people. Some of you, like my prayer team, no one even hardly knows who they are. They meet somewhere in back rooms. My prayer team did a most important work, praying that lives would be changed that weekend. Some of you served in children's ministry where over 60 children made first-time decisions for Christ. Some of you greeted people. Others served in the cafe. Others of you led worship or did video and sound so people could see, people could hear in person and also online. Others cleaned, set up, took down, repaired things, painted things in preparation for when people would come. God bless all of you who serve and who give, who pitch in, who help us make room and welcome people of peace who are seeking the Lord and a place to belong to. And so Larry is worshiping with us. He's being discipled by a mentor. He's being supported by a small group of others. And together with others, he is serving. And then one day, Larry turns to the Lord and says, Lord, I want to do for my neighbor Bill what you did in my life. And the missional living process that you see here begins all over again to the glory of God with Larry now seeking 
prayerfully seeking God's direction and power and beginning to genuinely pray and care for and share what Jesus means to him with his friend and neighbor, Bill. And that church is a description of what it means to be on mission, what it means to live missionally. And you see, you don't need a theological degree to do this. You don't need to be a super Christian to do this. All you need is to surrender your life to Jesus and be available to him to live his life of love through you in reaching those that he brings into your life. And so my question is, are you living a missional lifestyle? Is there a person of peace in your life that you are praying for and caring for and sharing with and believing God to one day bring to himself? Here's the thing. When you begin to live a missional lifestyle, your relationship with Jesus will go to another whole new level. You see, if your Christian life is lethargic, if your marriage is on life support, if your children are bored and going through the motions of their faith, if your small group lacks life and passion, I can predict with a high degree of accuracy that one, if not the main reason, is that you aren't seriously living the missional lifestyle that Jesus has called us to and challenging your family, your friends to join you in that. Mark my words, if the primary focus of your life, the primary focus of the life of your family is to be comfortable, to be safe, and secure from the evil in our world. If it's to play it safe, to stockpile wealth, to live for yourself, and to experience the temporary things on your bucket list that won't mean anything when you breathe your last. If that is where you are at, then you're going to be miserable and bored and so will the people around you. Because you see, you and your family will have missed the very reason God created you and put you here in Calgary for such a time as this. Yes, it will take conviction and sacrifice giving up some evenings watching hockey and Netflix. It will take conviction and sacrifice to step out and give priority to invest in the life of others. It will take conviction and sacrifice to give of your time and your money and your abilities to, to serve Jesus and to see the cause of Christ grow. But I can tell you from personal experience, that nothing will awaken and grow your faith more. Nothing will enrich your prayer life more. Nothing will increase your dependence on God more. Nothing will bond your marriage, your family, your friendships more, or give you a greater love, joy, peace, fulfillment and satisfaction in life or glorify God more than when you and those close to you pursue Jesus with all of your heart, soul, and mind and the mission that he's called you to. May it be so. To the glory of God and for the sake of a world that needs the Jesus that we know and love. Would you just take a moment just to bow before the Lord now and to ask him, Lord, what are you saying to me about missional living? And Lord, what is 
What is it that you're calling me to do? What, what's the first step you want me to take? 